Hi, this lecture reviews some of the key works from the late classical and Hellenistic periods associated with ancient Greece. So we're moving out of the classical period when we see kind of the height of power in Athens and we move into a period of the Peloponnesian War. So the Peloponnesian War is a period where fighting goes in stages over a period of about 30 years, from, so from about 431 BCE to 404 BCE. Um, the Peloponnese is an area around here, and basically you had cities either siding with Athens or siding with Sparta, and these two powers of the area of Greece were fighting one another over this long period. Eventually Athens will lose and their government system will change and at that point they still remain a cultural and artistic center but they're no longer the political power that they once were during the what's considered kind of the golden age or classical period of the mid 5th century BCE. So we're entering into a new period politically and in terms of warfare this is a period that begins to tear Athens apart to a certain extent. Uh, so as we move to the late classical period. This is a period where we're moving out of that classical style or style that's sometimes considered the golden age style of Athens in uh, the fifth century BCE when we tend to think of the style as nearly perfect. So uh, we're moving towards strong naturalism in the classical period. Uh, figures tend to not have a lot of emotion displayed in their faces, but as we move towards the late classical and Hellenistic period, we'll start to see this change. Uh, works of art become a little bit less conservative and we start to to see more emotion, especially in the Hellenistic period. So the label late classical typically indicates to art historians that we're moving into a period of decline. Uh, however, we do see some important artistic contributions during this late classical period. And the work of art that we're going to focus on is a work by Praxiteles, who's considered a very significant late classical sculptor. Uh, the work that we're seeing here is a Roman copy. Remember that a lot of these works only survived to, to us as Roman copies because so many of them were lost as bronze originals or the originals were just never passed down. So luckily the Romans appreciated the Greek aesthetic, the Greek style of sculptures, and created uh, their own copies. So this is the Aphrodite of Cnidos. So Cnidos is a small island over on this side off the shore of, main, of um, modern day Turkey. And the Aphrodite of Cnidos became very well known because it was a nude representation of the female form. So if you recall back to the archaic period when we saw the Peplos Core, who was a female figure who was very covered up wearing a traditional peplos. Uh, so remember that traditionally the male form could be nude. It was considered quite heroic and beautiful, uh, but the female form in the archaic period was very much covered up. However, by the, four, by the fourth century, so this period of about 350 to 340 BCE, we do see uh, some new styles of sculptures being produced where we're seeing a nude female. Of course, this is Aphrodite, goddess of love and lust, so it perhaps is considered more appropriate to have her represented in the nude, or at least possible. Uh, maiden goddesses like Artemis or like Athena, would it would be quite scandalous if they were represented in the nude. But nevertheless, this sculpture was quite scandalous, uh, and eventually the people of Cnidos accepted it, and it was probably displayed in some kind of round temple where people could really move around it and see it from all sides. So that's one possibility for its display. Uh, the moment that we're seeing here is we're catching her in a moment either as she's about to bathe or she's just finishing up her bathing, um, but it's as if we've caught her and she's covering up her genitalia, she's reaching for her garment, it's covering up a hydria, which is a vase that holds water. You can just see the handle of it here. Presumably the original would not have this strut connecting it, but because the Romans typically carved their sculptures out of marble uh, and it lacks a certain amount of strength, you need to have these little supports, so the struts provide that support. So uh, this style of sculpture becomes very important, this style of Venus or Aphrodite covering herself up, catching her in this moment. We sometimes call um, the gesture where she's covering up both her genitalia and her breasts as the Venus pudica gesture, the modest Venus pose. So um, this would presumably be quite exciting to kind of catch this, catch her in a moment where she least expects it. So uh, that would add to the excitement of this sculpture.
Next we move into the Hellenistic period. So uh, there was a period when Alexander the Great becomes quite powerful. Alexander will uh, take control of the area of southern Greece. His father will take control of it. Uh, Philip will take control of it. Then Alexander comes into power and they're able to spread the power of um, the Macedonians throughout the area of Mesopotamia, through Egypt, all the way into Persia and over towards India. So the empire that he's able to establish in a relatively short amount of time, he rules from 336 uh, at the point of the assassination of his father until his death in 323 BCE. So this period of his death becomes known as the Hellenistic period. So his death up until the death of Cleopatra and Mark Antony um, at the point when Augustus is coming to power in Rome, this is known as the Hellenistic period. It's a period when the empire of and the per period of the empire of Alexander is broken up into pieces uh, among the generals of Alexander. So you can see there are different parts of the empire here. Here's the part controlled by Ptolemy. There's another part here, another part here part here, and uh, there were also more independent cities, so Pergamon, for example, kind of had its own area, and we'll look at Pergamon in just a second. So art of the Hellenistic period is quite uh, unique for its drama, its emotion, its interest in violence, and the extremes of human existence. So uh, it's usually considered quite an appealing style uh, because it explores these areas of human experience and emotion. Uh, the Hellenistic period is quite complex politically because the empire is broken up into these different areas and it's also considered a very important period economically because areas like Egypt were really thriving during this time. So it's an important period in multiple facets of history, um, but in terms of artwork the style is quite exciting and unique. So focusing in here, we are looking at a work that is again a Roman copy. It's a floor mosaic from the city of Pompeii, which was preserved through the volcanic eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 CE or AD. Uh, and so luckily it preserved this floor mosaic, which we believe originally was a Hellenistic painting that commemorates the Battle of Issus, which was a battle that Alexander was involved in against uh, Darius III, who's over here. So um, easy to lose Alexander here because it is a very damaged area, but this is Alexander on this side, this is Darius III over on this side. Uh, we think that it's a Hellenistic sculpture or Hellenistic uh, painting or a Hellenistic painting was the model for this floor mosaic because it has a very uh, earth tone color scheme so it has these kind of light browns and then darker browns and yellows. Uh, it doesn't have a very detailed background to it uh, so we do think that it is based on a Hellenistic original. Uh, again, there's not much of a landscape, and there are areas that are missing from the mosaic, um, but it does give us a sense of the kind of drama that was incorporated into Hellenistic works of art. So there's definitely a crowd that's moving about here. Um, you can see Alexander running into battle here. He's already stabbed this individual here, but you can see he's already looking past him onto Darius III, and Darius III is being pushed off of the battlefield or being carted off the battlefield in his chariot. Um, you can see his charioteer grabbing onto his whip, whipping the horses, while uh, Darius is kind of extending his arm, possibly begging for mercy or you know, hoping for Alexander to retreat. Uh, but you can see that on his side, the Persian warriors or soldiers are looking rather concerned. It's a bit chaotic um, and we would expect that Alexander's soldiers would look quite orderly on this side, but the general idea is that they're charging into battle whereas the Persians are looking more chaotic. Uh, you have a couple of artistic devices that are noticeable. You have a horse that's foreshortened so it's actually going into the picture plane which is quite exceptional and then also you have a figure that's gazing into a shield and seeing his own reflection. So a few elements that have been incorporated here. Right. The Battle of Issus took place right here, just to orient you geographically. Uh, and then here we're just zooming in on Darius III. Uh, you can see him here, and it's usually easy to differentiate the Persians from uh, Alexander's troops. They have a specific style of uh, hat that they're wearing or headdress, and then they also tend to wear pants, long tuni tunics and pants. So it's usually pretty easy to spot them. And the artist of this is attributed to the, the Hellenistic original is Philoxen Philoxenes of Eretria. Uh, however, there have been some other suggestions as well. 
All right, another work of Hellenistic sculpture comes from the Victory Mon Monument of Attalus I, who reigned from 241 to 197 BCE, and it's to celebrate a victory over the Gauls, who were uh, a people that came from the west and were continually kind of harassing different cities around the area of Pergamon. So Pergamon's located in modern-day Turkey, and at this this is one idea for how the Victory Monument would have appeared, but the idea was that uh, the people of Pergamon were finally able to defeat this group of Gauls, and so what we see here is a Gallic chieftain, rather than being taken captive, he's committing suicide and having already killed his wife. So we see her here collapsing, we see him plunging the dagger into his chest, and little bits of blood are coming down. Again, this is a Roman copy, uh, so we're not seeing the original. We can see their ethnic difference in the fact that they have choppier hair, um, he's wearing a mustache or he has a mustache, so there are clear indications that anyone at Pergamon would have been able to uh, recognize that these were outsiders. Another figure on the Victory Monument would have been the Dying Gaul, so we see him here um, laying down. He also has a wound, you can see blood coming from this wound on the side. He's wearing a torque or kind of a rope necklace. He has that same choppy hair and mustache, so we know that he's an outsider. He's not a person of Pergamon, he's a, a, he's a Gallic warrior. Uh, he has his trumpet here and also he's on his shield so uh, we know he's at this point of decline that he's dying and this should bring to mind those dying warriors from the pediments of the temple of Aphia at Egina those figures that were collapsing the life was draining from them um, but here we see in the Hellenistic period an even more naturalistic figure, more detailed to muscles and veins and um, more naturalistic proportions. And if we um, zoomed in here even closer, you could see that he has deeply undercut eyebrows so that that adds to the emotion of his appearance. Another work from Pergamon is the alt Great Altar of Zeus, uh, which was a large structure that most of it has now been taken to Germany and is now in a museum called the Pergamon Museum. Inside the upper part recounts the founding of the city, and down below is a battle between the gods and the giants. So it was built by a successor of Adelos. Uh, so Adelos, remember, wanted to commemorate his victory over the Gauls. Uh, Eumenes created this large altar as a way of honoring Zeus. Uh, and just as a side note, Pergamon was eventually bequeathed to Rome in 133 BCE. So remember that Rome is becoming a very powerful city and empire at this point. So if we zoom in on a key scene, we see, we see Athena battling Alcinous. Um, this, so this is a scene between the gods, Athena, and the giants. So these are giant figures here. Um, these are kind of snaky, earthly beings. And so Athena is defeating Alcinous by ripping him from the earth. So his mother, Gay, down here, uh, is trying to save him. You can see her kind of looking up at Athena and appealing to her, um, but to no avail. Athena is ripping him from the earth, and you can see his snaky legs and and snaky forms coming out from him, and you can see his deeply undercut eyes showing his concern, and Athena is going to kill him, and we know that she's going to be victorious because she's being crowned victorious by the figure of Nike here. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the faces are damaged, but Nike would have had a head and Athena would have had a face, um, but unfortunately, those are now missing. Uh, and the figure of Athena here is reminiscent of the figure of Athena on the pediment at the Parthenon. So both the dying Gaul and uh, the figure here are reminiscent of certain examples from uh, the archaic and classical periods, uh, indicating that there's definitely still a respect for these periods as we move into the Hellenistic time. And a final Hellenistic work, probably one of the most famous currently in the Vatican, is the Laocoon. And this is a work of art that um, is believed to be by three sculptors of Rhodes. Uh, there were stories about this work, stories that it was crafted out of a single piece of marble, but in fact it's probably made of multiple works, when this, uh, or multiple pieces. When this work was first discovered, Michelangelo was actually there when it came out of the earth in around the year 1500. Uh, so it was a very impressive sculpture in the ancient past, but also was very important in the Renaissance as well. What we see here is the figure of Laocoon, who warned the Trojans about accepting the Trojan horse, or accepting the wooden horse, that was a so-called gift of the Greeks. Um, but at that point, the gods had already decided that the Greeks were going to win, so a snake was sent and he was killed. So we see this moment of a snake about to bite into his hip. We see him writhing in pain and concern. Um, his, bus his body is very muscled and youthful, but his face tends to show his age. We have those deeply kind of undercut eyebrows 
eyebrows as well. Um, we see one of his sons trying to escape and one that's about to be killed. Uh, all three figures are joined together by this snake and all of them are writhing in pain and de definitely showing their concern. So the story of the Trojan War remains definitely relevant as we move along and remains an important story. Um, and next we'll be moving on to the Etruscans.